Uh, good morning, everyone. And happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Betts. I'm standing in for Pastor Jim this morning. I was very blessed and honored that he asked me to come here for Father's Day. He is still out on his trip. She'll be back very soon. But when he asked me to come speak here, I was pretty pleased because the only services I've ever led before have been our youth services. And we had a lot of youth speaking, a lot of we have video, different things. So this is my first real service kind of being in charge of where you got to speak for a big chunk of time. And that makes you pretty nervous. <laughs> I'm so happy to do that here for the first time because this is a credit to all of you and the congregation, but this is a very comfortable place to be. Um, you guys are extremely loving. Um, I feel like I could do a terrible job and you'd still love me and say I did a good job anyways. So you guys have a wonderful church, wonderful heart, and I'm, I'm just so glad I get to do this here. Um, but with that being said, I am not going to do it by myself. <laughs> I went ahead, uh, typically for Father's Day, we get a couple guest speakers to come on up and share a little Father's Day testimony or a little story, and we're going to do the same thing here. And so I'm going to call up first your very own Tristan Coleman. Good morning, everybody. As Aaron said, I'm Tristan. Coleman, and um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of who I am. Um, my mom and dad are Steve and Carrie Coleman. My dad's usually an usher out at the uh, front door, but he's on this trip as well, so I'm filling in. And then um, my mom, she usually sits around in the back, but you can't miss her smiling face when you walk in. Um, I'm married to my beautiful wife, Hannah, who's in the back. And um, we have our two sons, Lincoln and Maverick, who are usually running around throughout the church, you know, being all rambunctious. Um, I'm also an usher here, more of a fill-in. Um, but when I'm not doing that, we are all the way in the back of the church. <laughs> so when Aaron asked me to speak, um, I was a little hesitant because I don't exactly like getting up here and speaking. But um, I remembered something that my dad told me. Um, quite a while ago, and it was um, just say yes. So that's what I did, so here I am. Um, being a father has taught me a lot of things, and I would like to start with a story about my first son coming into the world. So before he came along, um, I had had cousins, and you know, I have a younger sister, but I never really held any of those babies. Um, kind of freaked me out a little bit. I know Mike's similar, so you just, you're so big and you're looking at how small they are and you're like, they're, they're, I'm going to end up breaking this thing, you know. So um, I just preferred not to hold the babies. But it was a, it was a very hard time for Hannah in the hospital. Um, it was about two and a half days we were in there before Lincoln made his grand appearance at 3.30 in the morning. And uh, Hannah was extremely exhausted after, um, you know, giving birth to him. So um, she pretty much fell right asleep afterwards. But the, uh, the nurses cleaned him up, they weighed him, they measured him, and then said, here you go, Dad. And then they handed me a bottle and they just left the room. And um, I was completely caught off guard. I thought I was going to be eased into fatherhood with the help of my wife. But that was not the case. In my mind, the only thing keeping me from killing this little thing just fell asleep. <laughs> so I did the one thing I knew to do, and I prayed, and I said, Dear God, please guide me, because I do not know what I'm doing. And then I looked down at Lincoln, and I said, Well, buddy, the two of us are going to figure this out together. So the first lesson as fathers that we need to learn is to look to the Lord for guidance in everything that we do. Isaiah 58, 11 says, The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. God will always be there for us when we do not know what to do. 
and he has all the answers that we can possibly need. The next thing I would like to talk about is patience. If anyone knows me, I have very, very little patience. And you need to have a lot of patience as a father. My son Maverick lives by his name a thousand percent. He's not scared to try anything. He goes head first with everything that he does. And with that, he doesn't exactly listen to what me and Hannah have to say. So the two of us look to each other for help with him because he knows how to push every single button. I pray quite often that God would give me patience to deal with these problems. And if you ever have prayed for patience, there are a lot of tests coming. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are all the things that fathers should be working on. Children take a lot of work to raise, but the closer we walk to the Lord, the easier it will become. We will begin to look more and more like Him. 1 Timothy 1.16 says, But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience as an example for those who would believe in Him and receive eternal life. If I am to look more like God, I need to have immense patience with my children because God had immense patience with me. Next point is a little more difficult to talk to you guys about. I almost broke down in the first service, but I'm going to try to hold it together a little better here. Currently, Hannah is actually pregnant with our fifth baby. We've had two miscarriages since we started our family. It is not an easy walk to go through. I question God both times, wondering why he would let something like that happen to us. Hannah and I spent many nights talking about our emotions and praying that God would just get us through these tough times. People always talk about how hard a miscarriage is for the mothers, but they fail to realize that it affects the fathers as well. And I'm so thankful that Hannah thought about me during the process as well. I still do not understand why it happened, but shortly after the second miscarriage, I felt a calm spirit come over me. And I knew that I needed to trust the Lord even when I didn't understand it. The verse that comes to mind is Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It doesn't mean when things stop making sense to us that we just give up on God. To God, it all makes sense because He can see the full picture. The last thing that I want to talk about is wisdom. Within the next month, Hannah and I, Hannah will give birth to our first baby girl, Elsie Jo. I'm overly excited for her to be here. I've always wanted a daughter since before I can remember. This new season is going to bring its own challenges, though. Anna and I have decided that she is going to become a stay-at-home mom, which means we'll be dropping to one income. It is a sacrifice that we're making because of our country's failing school system. We have already started making changes to our budget to accommodate the lack of income, but we are still going to have to lean on the Lord for His wisdom. It's important that we ask God to give us wisdom to be able to budget well and give our children a good education. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. All we have to do is ask. God is always listening to us, and He is waiting for us to put down our pride and come to Him humbly. I have only been a father for four years, and God has taught me so much. 
I cannot see the I cannot wait to see what he has in store for me to come. I would like to challenge all the men here to ask God for help with all of these points. Trust, wisdom, guidance, and patience. Let God help lead you as a father, even if your kids are all grown up. For those of you that don't have kids, take a look around you and find someone to take under your wing. I hope you all will enjoy becoming better fathers, and most importantly, better Christians with me. Happy Father's Day. So the scary thing about actually coming up here and speaking, not only you got to do it in front of people, you got to be publicly vulnerable like that, but it's on video. And now, <laughs> the cool thing is, like for Tristan, he's sharing that right now, and it's on video. They can go, his kids can go and look at this and see their father coming up there saying yes and being vulnerable and really just giving glory to God. And so what a great example already that we get to see a father to his sons. So that's wonderful. Um, when it comes to the name father, I do not view it as just a title. It's like, oh, I, I've had a child now. Now I get this name. Uh, I don't view it like that at all because I think there's a lot of people who have kids that are not great fathers. Um, to me, it's a job. It is a God-given responsibility. If God allows you to have this child, you have a duty. You need to provide. You need to protect you need to care for, you need to teach, lead, and guide by example. Um, teach this child about God. And so many of us, you know, we do have good examples. A lot of us do. Um, I'm just going to talk about my story real quick, but my father is Pastor Rick. And so I've told everybody, when I see him at church and he's up there preaching everything, he goes home and I'm home with him and he's still talking about God. He, he is the same person on stage as he is at home. And I got to see that example growing up. And here's something else that's kind of cool. I didn't share this in the other services, but I still need a father. I'm 32 years old. I have my own children. I still need my dad. Um, fatherhood does not stop when you are, you know, when the, your kids move out or anything. Fatherhood continues on. I still need my dad. I go to him more now than I ever have in my entire life. Uh, I'm just looking for godly wisdom. And that's the great thing. That's why we have fathers. Yeah. You know, I, I, I search out God and everything, but sometimes God just says, listen, I gave you a dad. Go to him. Get that wisdom already. He's right there. And so I do that all the time. And so we still need our dads. It is always, forever. But here's the thing. That's my story. I have a dad that is constantly pointing me to Jesus. We, not everyone has that. And so uh, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and just say everyone should be like me and, and go to their dad, do all this, because not everyone has that same story. Not everyone has that availability. Because some dads left. Some dads, you know, tragedy could strike. And so many people didn't have their fathers. And so... It taught me something pretty quickly where I came to the place where when I was sinning, I would, you know, have temptation, sin, and I'd give in every single time I knew better. And that's something not everyone can say. When I messed up, I knew better. And so I think, you know, even if my sins were smaller than what you might consider some other people, I think my sins were just as bad because I was more accountable because I knew better. My dad taught me right and wrong. My dad showed me why I should make good decisions and all this stuff. And then you have other dads out there that either don't teach at all, aren't there. And uh, at the Georgetown service, I went there last night and they sang a song that said, children need their dads when the dad's not home and makes the children sad. That's the chorus of the song. And it, it's so true. And so sometimes fathers just, they, they prioritize everything else. They're not home and they don't get to teach their kids. And so then what is teaching them? Uh, Tristan was just up here talking about the messed up school system. And, you know, sometimes uh, I, I was a teacher, so I, I got to see a little bit of both sides of it. 
I know the schools don't mean bad, but they just leave so much stuff out that the result is bad. <laughs> uh, because there's, if the fathers aren't there to teach, then someone else will teach them. Other kids will teach them. And it's, trust me, it's so much better to have a father teach than it is someone your own age. That's the worst thing kids do, is that when they need advice, they go to their friend. That is the worst thing. That, that was me. You know, my dad was so, you know, good in my eyes, like, oh, I'm struggling with something. I don't want to go to there. <laughs> I want to go to the other person struggling. And guess what? I make bad decisions. <laughs> and so that's what happens when the fathers aren't there. Um, but here's the neat thing. For anyone who didn't have that in their life, who didn't have that father to go to, God's there. And God gave us that great example. I just said I got to see my, my dad be an example. Same person on stage as he is at home, great example. Well, for those that don't have that, they can still point to Jesus. Jesus was that perfect example. I said I gave him the temptation and I sinned. And this is how, how strong Jesus is. We don't normally think of Jesus as this strong, manly man and all this stuff, but that's because we have a messed up sense of what manliness is. He had every temptation that I've ever had. Jesus was tempted by that stuff. And we see in the Bible, he was tempted and he said no. Every time he was tempted, he said no. He's the only person to ever say no every single time to all those temptations. That's strength. That is a real man. That is a man stepping up for righteousness, doing what is right every single time. And that's what we need to strive to be. The Bible says we need to have a love for righteousness. Jesus had it. Let's follow that example. Even if you don't have the great examples in your life to follow, look to Jesus, and there we go. We have that example that we can follow. So I realized when I said that I was, even I made mistakes and sinned when I had a good example as a father, it puts you in a place where you can't judge anybody. When I had that, well, I had this great dad. He taught me right from wrong. He would even show me just wisdom, just if we see someone out in just the world and we can tell they're struggling, he would tell me why. He would say, listen, you know, these are decisions that were made and now he's got to deal with this. I don't want you to deal with that, so please make these wise decisions. He's teaching me, teaching me, teaching me all the time. And then there's dads out there that don't teach or they do teach and they teach their kids how to do evil. I, I, can't, I can't imagine what it would be like and I was a teacher, so I got to see it all the time. When kids go home to their dads who are smoking weed, to their dads who are looking at pornography, they're seeing all this junk and they're being taught to do the same because they're going to follow that example. And it's out there like crazy. Uh, I remember I had one student who obviously he had some kind of mental issue from, from trauma. It, it wasn't like a you know, just a mental thing. It was, it was a trauma-based problem. And I met his dad, and I thought, his dad is like, he seems like a really nice guy. I haven't seen too many dads like this. And I was wondering, where is this trauma coming from? Why is the kid acting this way? And by the end of the year, or before the end of the year, that dad got arrested for murdering somebody. And it's just, what in the world is going on at home? And so I, I got to see that. I see it all the time. The kids I taught, when the father was not in the house, we had behavior issues. When the father was not in the house, we had great issues. They did not care to be successful. They were not given that drive to be successful. And so we see so many examples of why, um, why it's so important that fathers are in the story. All right. Um, the Lego, Lego Ninjago movie um, came out years ago, but it just, it had a joke in it, but it, it's so true. And it, just, it has to be shared for Father's Day. The main character, he's yelling at his dad, who's the main villain in the story. And he goes to his dad and goes, like, Dad, you ruined my life. And the dad answers back, how could I have ruined your life? I wasn't even there. And it's so true. <laughs> Dads feel like, oh, you know what? They're a kid. I'm going to leave that to the moms. That's not my responsibility. And fathers are not stepping up to fulfill their responsibility. And kids need their fathers so much that the kid's yelling, you ruined my life just because you weren't there. And it's just a silly joke. And I, I laugh every, at it every time I hear it, but it rings so true. 
it, kids really feel that way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I counsel someone right now, and they're just, that's what's bothering them, is that their dad wasn't there. And it's over and over again, I hear it. My dad's not there. So many kids I counsel, all of them, the dads weren't there. So when they're going around and they're sinning and they're struggling, how in the world can I judge them? I didn't, I had a great example. I was taught right. And when they're not, who are we to say you couldn't have been just as bad? And so in those situations, when these people are struggling so much to do, just trying to do right, there's only one thing we can really do. Either step up and be that father figure to them that they're desperately wanting or point them to Jesus. Point them to the Father that is going to tell them right from wrong. Point them to God's Word that tells you right from wrong, that teaches them wisdom. That's the only thing we can do. Um, Psalm 68 verse 5 says, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God and His holy habitation. You see, God does not leave someone fatherless. We all have that heavenly father and he can step up and fulfill that role that your earthly father couldn't do. Um, I had a man uh, last night, he shared his testimony in Georgetown and so I got to hear it and I was so glad I went to church last night to hear it. But his dad wasn't there for him when he was growing up. And he said, but God put me in a place where I lived with my uncle and my grandfather and they stepped up and they were that role model for me. And so even though the real father didn't step up the way he should have, he had father role figures who stepped up. And that's why we say all the time, it really doesn't matter if it's just if you have a kid or not. That's not what makes you a father. It's stepping up and leading and showing people love the way that they should. It's stepping up to that role. Um, but here's the thing. Sometimes there's things in life where your earthly father can't help you. And I want to share uh, my testimony, um, my and my wife's testimony about how we kind of, it led to our parenthood, but where we really needed God. There's nothing my dad could have done, nothing her dad could have done to really fill that role. We needed our heavenly father in this moment. So um, I got married in 2018 and it wasn't too long after that that uh, my wife got pregnant and we went off to vacation with my parents. We went to Florida and we had this whole big plan worked out. We were going to play cards with them one night and on the cards we wrote out some little notes on there. Basically a way to surprise them to say, hey, we're pregnant. You're going to have uh, a grandchild and all this. And so we do that and we have kind of a fun moment and everything. And but on that trip, my wife started getting sicker than normal. And we're just like, oh, maybe the sickness gets worse as you go on. We, we don't know. This is our first time dealing with this. And, and she wasn't feeling good, cramping, and all this going on. And we get home, and she goes to her checkup. And sure enough, we lost our baby. Uh, and that was hard because we had, you know, we just told our parents and all this, and now we have to go make those phone calls. We know we just had this special moment where we announced our pregnancy to you, but it's not happening. And that's just, that's a hard moment. Uh, we, it hurt. It definitely hurt my wife. I was at the place at the time, you know, it was early, and I just have this trust in God. God, God I trust you know why this is happening, but I'm okay. Taylor struggled much more than I did. Well, um, we get pregnant a second time. And this time, Taylor was just sure. She really thought, all right, we had that first one, but this time this is happening. Um, she couldn't even tell me really why she felt so sure that this one was going to be the one. And so she's super excited. She is all in with this pregnancy. And then we lose that baby too. And it crushed her. It absolutely crushed her. I was at the same place of, God, I, I trust you. I don't know why this is happening, but I trust you. And the, the process was so hard each time because we kept on discovering new things, why we couldn't hold the baby and everything. And so we were, had to get Taylor on more hormones. We had to get her, we had to have surgeries done. I think by the time we had the second one, it was our third surgery, different things going on. 
And so it was just hard, a hard process. It wasn't just, okay, this happened. No, now it means we have to be in the doctor's offices. And so we we're in the doctor's. I mean, it felt like it was just constant appointments every week and getting stuff done. Um, Taylor going to surgery, then I'm helping her in recovery. And it just very long process. But because we're figuring out these things, we're having the surgeries and hormones, we're thinking, all right, we're learning a little bit more. We're learning a little bit more. And we're, we feel like we're getting closer and closer. Then we get pregnant a third time. And then this baby we lose very early on. And at this point, it's just, you, Tristan was even talking about like questioning. And I look over at my wife and she is really hurting. Uh, at this point, I'm terrified for my wife. She was just in a very dark place with her grief. She was questioning God and just, I mean, almost angry at God. I gotta say, she, she was angry at God. And I'm sitting there as her husband. It's like, I gotta be the spiritual leader of the household and everything. And it's like, if you're questioning God, then you don't have faith in God. And I was basically trying to be God's defender in all this. And looking back on it now, seeing how God used the grief and did all this, even though she was not perfect in how she handled everything, but neither was I. I was sitting there thinking, I've got faith, I've got all this, I'm good. And I'm, she's going through the grieving process and I'm almost scolding her for it. And just saying, you just gotta have faith in God. And, and here, here's the cool thing about God. He can handle a question much better than I can handle a question. God can handle even your anger, and it's okay. God is so much bigger than any of those things, and God hears all of it. God knows all of it. And, uh, but I was just at such a place, I just, I'd see my wife, and I, th I think I was losing her. I, I thought, like, I'm losing her. She's, like, God's losing her. Like, where is she going? Because I just, I never understood that kind of a feeling um, with that type of grief. And it just, I, I wasn't at the place of questioning, but she was, and God had to teach me a lot through this moment. And as hard as it is to think, even through miscarriage, even through a tragedy, God can use it to teach. So one day in one of our arguments, Taylor went and she's just, Aaron, I just want to know God sees me. And that was it. I just want to know God sees me. And here, here's the point I'm talking about. There's no one that can fix her problem right now. My dad can't go and be like, oh yeah, God sees you. No, that's not what she needed. At night. She needed God. It can't be her dad. Her dad couldn't do anything to help that situation. She's calling out to God in her grief. She's questioning and she's just, God, I need you right now. I need to know you're, you're with me through this because I'm breaking, I'm hurting. And as one of the moments for me where I'm at the same place of, like, I know God. I know God sees you. Like, we, like the Bible says he hears everything we say. It's like if he cares about the sparrow, of course he cares about us. <laughs> and that's where I'm at. But in the moment, that is exactly what she needed. She needed to know, have like a sign from God that he sees her. And she's being honest. And looking back on it, like there was so much guilt in me knowing she's going through this grieving process instead of just, I mean, I was telling her the right things, but I wasn't being supportive the way I should have been supportive. And it was one of the coolest things. So she, she says that, I just want to know that God sees me. And so a few days later, I'm sitting in my classroom. I would always get to my class early and I'm getting my lesson ready. And then a teacher knocked on the door and came in. And she comes in, stand there, and you can tell she is nervous as anything. And there's another lady in the room with me. And this teacher that walked in goes, hey, Aaron, I have to tell you something, but I don't want you to think I'm crazy. And I was like, don't worry, I, I know you, you're fine. I'm not going to think you're crazy. And she goes, well, I um, 
God woke me up last night and he told me to tell you something and I don't even know if it's for you, but I know I'm supposed to tell you. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You, you can tell me. He goes, God told me to tell you, I see you. And that was it. I see you. Three words. That's all it was. I see you. And immediately, it was like my jaw just dropped and hit the floor. That is the exact words we need. Those three words is the exact thing we needed. And she goes, so Aaron, does that mean anything to you? And I said, you have no idea how much that means to me, but it's not for me. It's for my wife. And she literally goes, oh, <laughs> just relief. She was so nervous to tell me because she was, if it meant nothing to me, she thought I'd, she'd look crazy. And I said, I know exactly what it is. It's for my wife. And I told her what my wife had said. And she goes, I knew I was supposed to tell you. I just didn't think it was for you. And so I was so nervous. And I go home and I tell Taylor about that. And Taylor immediately just tears start coming and she just goes and gives me this big hug. And it was one of the coolest moments because I got to see my wife change. It, it was incredible. She goes from just this place of, God, where are you? God, why is this happening? Just to know that God sees her, is with her through that whole process. It softened her. And all of a sudden, she's to the point of, all right, God, we're good. You know, God handled her anger. God handled the questions. Not that we know exactly why we had all the miscarriages and everything, but God met her where she needed, needed him. It was amazing. And so our Heavenly Father came in, stood up exactly where we needed him to be with those three words and softened her. And this is what's so cool. So I'm a big Ravens fan. Um, always rooted for them, especially like early 2000s. Ray Lewis was the Hall of Fame linebacker they had. He's my favorite player of all time. And so with Ray Lewis, if I were to go over to my phone and open it, and it says you have a text message from Ray Lewis. You know how special I'd feel? That he went out of his way to text me. He went out of his way to get up with me. I'd go around and show everybody. Guys, you know Ray Lewis? Yeah, he texts me. Hey, see this? Uh, people do all the time. If they go and meet like a famous athlete, they'll go around like, hey, see this picture? I got to meet him. I had a, a friend of mine who was playing basketball, and he ended up playing with... Uh, um, ex-NBA player who's now a GM for the Sixers with the Elton brand. And sure enough, right after he gets done playing basketball with him, he, he texts me and says, hey, look who I got to play basketball with. He's you know, doing all this. That's with a person, a human. God sent a special message to us. Do you realize how special that is? God has a lot of children. You know that? There's literally billions of them alive right now. <laughs> he has a lot of children, and yet he thinks I'm special enough to send a message to. He thinks my wife is special enough to send a message to her. Just so you know, God thinks you're special enough to send a message to you too. When you need your Heavenly Father, He's going to show up. He will arrive. He will answer exactly what you need answered. He is going to be there exactly when you need Him. And so you can have faith in that. So um, what happens next is we get pregnant a fourth time. And in this fourth pregnancy, we go and we actually get to see the heartbeat, get to have all these things. And normally when we lose our babies is right around the first end of the first trimester and everything. And we get to this point, and we've, you know, pretty far along, we get to see all this, and further than we've gotten along before. And so we're excited. We are so excited. We go home, and on, on the ride, Taylor's, I mean, we're excited enough now that, you know, Taylor, we, we got our word. We feel good now. Um, God's got us. God answered. And on the ride home, we're talking about baby names. And so we're talking girls' names, boys' names, and all this. And then Judah goes, or Judah, my wife goes, 
what do you think about the name Judah? I said, no, absolutely not. I can't stand that name. I knew a, a kid when I was younger with the name Judah, and he was not a very pleasant fellow. And so I wanted nothing to do with that name. And she goes, well, I, just, I really like it because I, I like what it means. I was like, all right, what does it mean? She goes, praise. And I broke. I, I've only had this happen to me maybe twice in my life, but I'm sitting there driving this car and I start weeping. And it hit me hard. This Holy Spirit just came over and I am weeping. And once I get done and I can actually get words out, I was like, okay, name's going to be Judah. We already know it's going to be a boy. And I said, we're going to praise God even through all the miscarriages. And so at this point, we're so excited, you know, in my mind, it's like, I've got this promise from God. We have this boy coming and I was just so excited. Next week comes along to our next appointment and we find out we lose this baby too. And this one broke me. I, I've never been broken quite like this in my life. Um, the ride home was just silence and all of our appointments had to be at Christiana and everything. So we got this long drive home and we were just quiet and um, I get home and I, I get in the phone and I start calling family and I, I couldn't get through the phone calls. I, I try to get out the words that we lost the baby and I had to pull the phone away uh, just because I'm just crying and crying and I bring it back, try and get a few more words out. Nope, can't get it. Pull it back. I was, I called my uh, brother Andrew and he was in the line at Walmart and he's sitting there He's like, I'm starting to cry in the line. Um, Cause he just, he knew how devastated we were. Cause we really thought that w this was the time. And here I am, I'm just completely broken. And I go into the house after I get off the phone and I'm, I've just been outside and like leaned up on a tree, just weeping. Come inside finally. And there's my wife and she's okay. Uh, I'm completely broken and my wife is okay. And she comes over and she's comforting me. And it was, I mean, as terrible as the moment was, it was one of the neatest things to see the proof that my wife had changed. <laughs> to see the proof that that word from God changed her to now I was constantly having to go and comfort her because she wasn't okay. And now when I'm not okay, my wife is there, steps up, and now is comforting me when I'm not. And it was, it, it's so neat to now look back on it and see how God can use tragedy. My wife went back and said, uh, if we had had a baby after that first or second miscarriage, I wouldn't have been okay. I, I would have not, never gotten right with God. I was so upset, questioning, and angry at God. If I had a baby before God got my heart right, I wouldn't have been okay. God knows exactly what you need. And here's the, the neat thing. With miscarriages, we, we've been through it, and one of the comforting things is I truly believe our, those babies are in heaven. God, God created that life, so I believe they're in heaven. And what is it to God thinking eternally, if, we take this, if he takes that baby, that baby's in heaven. Eternally thinking, it's good. Um, we're hurting, but God used that hurt to create you know, a newness in my wife that wasn't there before, that created understanding in me that wasn't there before, that created a marriage much stronger than what it was before. God knows we need it for some reason. I might not understand why, I might still question why we had to go through all that, but God took us through it, and I know coming out of it, we're stronger and we trust in him more now than we ever did. That's our God, and God is that father who can have compassion. Psalm 103, verse 13 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. We've experienced that compassion when God made us feel special, when God made sure that, you know, my wife got exactly the words she needed to make her okay. 
but God also has tough love. And he's going to teach us. He's going to take us through hard times, and we're going to struggle. But coming out of it, God knows he's going to make us stronger. That's a good father. That's a good father that knows both sides of the coin. There needs to be compassion, but there also needs to be tough love. God is good. Um, <laughs> we got pregnant uh, a fifth time. And this pregnancy was also pretty difficult. Uh, by the point where we lost all of our babies, we get to that point and I test positive for COVID. They would not let us into the hospital until Taylor and I both tested negative. And I kept testing positive over and over and over again. And during that time, they didn't have the quick ones. It was just, you know, go to Walgreens, go to this wilderness place, and you'll hear about it in a few days. And so each time it felt like we were getting pushed back a week. We're, we're so nervous. We know we're pregnant. We know this is where the time that we lose this baby. And now we're going a month past where we've ever been before, and we're not allowed to even get checked up on. And after all of our surgeries and different things, we were used to being checked up every single week. So eventually, we went ahead and said, guys, we're, we're, we're scared. And we got my family together, put Taylor in the middle of the room, everyone put hands on her, and we just prayed. We prayed for that baby. And um, eventually, I went to get another COVID test, and I cheated. I wanted to make sure I tested negative, so I didn't need to do anything. I just, I tapped my nose. That's all I did. <laughs> sure enough, got that negative test and we were in the hospital immediately. And we go in there and we see our baby. We get to see this baby that was far a month further along than we'd ever gotten before. Everything looks good, everything looks healthy, but the baby was small. Uh, during the pregnancy, the baby got down to the fourth percentile in size. And once you get down there, they're very concerned. Uh, the, the plan was to go ahead and do a early pregnancy. Um, that way they could do more, uh, I guess, more medical things. I don't know. So they wanted to take the baby early. And so we're letting family know. Well, my father-in-law came to us at one point and he says, God told me to pray specifically. He's like, I've just been praying this whole time, you know, help our baby grow, help our baby grow. He's like, God told me to pray specifically. He's like, so I've chosen to pray specifically that the next checkup you go to, that baby's going to be in the 20th percentile. Once you get to the 20th percentile, they feel comfortable. Like, oh yeah, you can keep holding that baby. We don't need to take them early and anything. And so we all start praying specifically for 20th percentile, which is a huge increase. And it was one of the coolest appointments we have ever had. The nurse comes in, is checking the size, and you know, doing all the ultrasound things, hitting the buttons, and we're looking at it, and I'm seeing numbers up there I haven't seen before. Our baby's always been really little, and now they're looking bigger. And she eventually leaves the room, and the doctor comes in. And the doctor comes in, and he goes, sometimes these things happen, um, but I just want to go ahead and remeasure to be safe. And so he's remeasuring. He's not talking to us. That's all he said to us. And so he's measuring. And eventually he gets done. And he goes, your baby started to grow. I don't understand it. Your baby started to grow. And so his growth chart was basically level, 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 boom. As soon as we started praying specifically for 20th percentile, that baby's chart whew, shot up. And so I asked him, so... What, based on your measurements, what do you think his percentile is? He's like, well, it's different for each body part, but I'd say overall, maybe approximately around 18. And I said, that's close enough to 20 for me. <laughs> Thank you, God. That was such a blessing. And so we got to see with this whole pregnancy, just we're relying on God. And it, it, you go through four miscarriages and you'd think that we'd be at the place of like, mm, we're done with God. We, we've been relying on him this whole time. We'd be done. No, this whole pregnancy, we're relying on him and God is answering and we get to see miracles happen and we end up having our wonderful baby boy, Judah. He is now just about to turn three years old, but the whole process to get there, it hurts looking back on it because of the, the tragedy 
and knowing what we went through. But then I look at God and you realize that my father was with me my, the entire time and how good of a father he really is. Um, there's no way I can't look back on this and not just feel grateful because now we don't ha just have Judah, we also have Theodore. Theodore means gift of God. This pregnancy with, Jude, or with Theodore was much easier. Um, we didn't have nearly any of the concerns, but we did have a much harder birth. <laughs> um, that was not fun at all. But um, the pregnancy was much easier than it was with Judah. But you see these two wonderful boys, and you have to be grateful. Because something my wife said when she got to the place where she was okay, she goes, I wanted what I wanted. God never promised me that I'd have kids. I just took it as a given. You know what? I got married. Now it's time for me to have kids and all this. She wanted her way, and she wasn't willing to have it God's way. And so now she got to that point, which is why she had that fourth miscarriage. She's okay now. God never promised she'd have kids. And now we have two, and now you can't help but feel blessed and so grateful. Now you can't help but see our boy Judah and remember, we got to praise God. We can't help but look at Theodore and remember, God didn't promise us this, this boy. This is a gift. It is such a gift to have these boys. And when you go through life with that attitude now, with gratefulness, going through parenthood with gratefulness, now when Judas throws his tantrums and everything, as frustrating as it can be, I'm still so grateful for that boy. I'm still going to praise God for that boy. God's given me a, a God-given responsibility to help lead him and raise him the way he should go. And through the frustration, I'm going to do my best. It is a God-given responsibility, and I'm grateful for it. One of the things I've been teaching our youth group is from this verse. This is Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, all things that a good father should have, just so you know. Spiritual wisdom, understanding, following God's will. So as we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing the knowledge of God. In a manner worthy of God. This is what I'm sticking to. Whatever I do, I want to do it in a manner worthy of God. I want to be a father that raises my kids in a manner that is worthy of God, in a way that when, if God were to come to me and he'd see everything I've done to raise my boys, would he be proud of me or would he be ashamed? I want God to be proud of how I'm raising my boys. I want God to be proud of how I lead our youth group. I want God to be proud of just how I do anything throughout the day. And this is such a wonderful verse to realize whatever you do, because it doesn't stop at fatherhood. It can go to mothers. It can go to jobs. It can go to anything. Whatever you do, do it in a manner that is worthy of God because people are watching. You're claiming to be a Christian. You better go throughout your day in a manner worthy of God. Because if you're going away that's not, people are watching and they're going to follow it. doesn't matter if you have kids or not. Um, I, I, I know so many times I, ha I have stories of people. It's like, yeah, I just saw them do an action. Not someone I'm related to. I just saw an action. And now it makes me think, all right, that was good. I want to be more like that. Um, one of the silliest things, but I've seen YouTube videos about people who literally just go and they see a cart in the parking lot and they'll go and put that cart away even though it's not their cart and people will come out and give them like a hey way to go here's a fifty dollar bill they're just people doing things they should be doing and that enters my mind and so yesterday i put three carts away that weren't mine <laughs> but i see it somebody was out there doing just living life in a manner worthy of god just putting carts away that weren't theirs and now it got me doing the same thing so it doesn't have to be a father, it doesn't have to be a mother, it can be anyone. It doesn't, whatever you're doing, do it in a way that's worthy of God because then people will follow and they see that example. And when you do it the wrong way, people follow that too. And it breaks my heart when kids struggle and I see the example that they've been following. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we are doing everything in our possibility to lead people to Jesus 
If we're Christians, let's go out there, let's live it. Let's go out there and do whatever we do, our jobs, our families, whatever it is, in a manner worthy of God. So I want to give everyone this opportunity. Um, we always do a crossroad. But if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know that good Father we're singing about, I want you to have that chance to say, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to follow His example and nothing else. So if that's you, if you want that in your life, I'm going to have you, ask you to raise your hand right now. Does anybody want to make that commitment today? All right, I don't see any hands, so we'll trust and believe you've done that. But something else we always do on Father's Day is we bless the fathers. Um, so if, you, if any men are 18 years or older, please just stand up. Any men 18 years and older. <laughs> if you're around them or family, just go ahead and just put a hand on them. We're just going to pray just a blessing over the fathers today. Lord God, thank you for these men. Thank you for bringing them here today, Lord. Already they're showing a great example by being here in church. Lord, I just pray that you do, you bless them. You give them all the attributes they need to be a great example and a great father. Lord, give them humility. Give them patience, Lord. God, I, I pray that you bring them to a place of being willing to humble themselves when they're wrong, but being able to stand up for you when they know that they're right. So God, I just pray that um, you show them the way throughout this week, Lord. Whenever they feel like they've done something that's not in a manner worthy of you, let them repent of it and then go forward and continue to do it in a manner worthy of you, that they're going to bless you, glorify you in their actions, and that when they claim to be a Christian, there's going to be people following and seeing this, Lord, that they're going to be able to lead other people to know you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, guys. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. This is a wonderful place to be again. Um, Dagsboro is a wonderful place. Uh, I love to be here. You guys always make me feel comfortable. So thank you all. Have a wonderful week, and you are dismissed.